Thanks for tuning in to Ancient Greece Declassified, Episode 7 The Persian Wars. In the previous couple of episodes, we looked at two developments that perhaps more than anything else defined the legacy of Greek civilization. These are the invention of democracy and the invention of theater, both happening around 508 BC. But less than 30 years later, these young, fledgling institutions, which we think of today as so pivotal to Western civilization, came under attack and were almost obliterated before they could take root. The Persian Empire gathered the largest expeditionary force ever assembled and crossed over into Europe to conquer Greece and in particular to destroy Athens. The Athenian population, which evacuated the city in the nick of time to some nearby islands, could see across the water their homes, their temples, and their city burning to the ground. To any observer at the time, Athens seemed to be done, finished, erased from history. But just a few years later, Athens would rise from the ashes as one of the most powerful states in all of Greece. How could that be? Let's rewind a few decades. In 508 BC, the Athenians established democracy, and it takes them a good decade or so to figure out how to get this new system running smoothly. The learning curve was steep, and they made some serious blunders early on. For one, being in desperate need of a strong ally to resist Spartan aggression, the Athenians sent an embassy to make an alliance with, wait for it, the Persian Empire. Meanwhile, though, the Spartans, for various reasons, back down. And once the Spartan threat is gone, the Athenians say, you know what, maybe that wasn't such a good idea to pledge our allegiance to Persia. Let's pretend that never happened. The problem is you can't really do that with the Persians. Contracts with them are binding. A few years later, the eastern Greek cities of Ionia, which had already been conquered by Persia, try to throw off the Persian yoke, and they ask Athens for help. And the Athenians, despite their recent alliance with Persia, provide assistance for the rebellion. This Ionian revolt, as it's called, is a complete disaster. The Persians massacre the Greeks of Ionia and destroy the city of Miletus, which was the main instigator of the revolt. And Darius, the king of Persia at the time, is really angry at the Athenians for betraying their former allegiance and helping the rebels against him. So Darius sends a fleet to punish Athens. The fleet lands at a place called Marathon, and this is the famous Battle of Marathon where the Athenians, surprisingly, win. Then Darius is even more angry and says, that's it, I'm going to gather the biggest army ever, literally, and invade Greece on land and by sea, crush the Athenians, and absorb Greece into the empire. He spends years preparing this enormous expedition, gathering soldiers from all across the empire, but he dies before he can execute his plan. His son, Xerxes, takes the throne, and his first order of business is to carry out his father's punishing expedition. So Xerxes invades Greece with this huge army and a huge navy supporting from the sea, and this is when you get the famous Battle of Thermopylae, portrayed in the movie 300, where a small Spartan army makes a heroic stand in a kind of suicide mission that delays the Persian advance and gives the Athenians time to evacuate their city. The Persians then reach Athens and burn it to the ground as the Athenians watch from nearby islands. But then, in a surprising turn of events, the Athenian navy, still intact, tricks the Persian navy into battle and destroys it. Xerxes, at that point, is like, okay, I'm done, and he takes the few remaining ships and sails home. The Persian land forces are defeated a few months later by a coalition of Greek city-states. That's the Persian Wars in a nutshell, and that's the beginning of what we call the Classical Period, when Athens rebuilds its city magnificently and becomes the new cultural and economic powerhouse of Greece for almost a century. Now, the big question, obviously, is how did the Greeks do it? How did they pull off this totally unexpected victory against the biggest invasion force that had ever been launched? 
And that's the question that will frame our discussion today. In particular, we're going to see what the latest research and archaeology tell us about the economies, technologies, and demographics of these civilizations. How do these factors affect the result of the conflict? And are there any historical patterns that we can discern here that apply to more recent history as well? Our guest today is archaeologist, award-winning author, and professor of classics at Stanford University, Ian Morris. His most recent book is called War, What Is It Good For?, which makes a counterintuitive claim that warfare, if we look at it over thousands of years, has actually made human societies progressively less violent. Our discussion will focus on the Persian Wars, but I'll be asking some questions inspired by the book. So, without further ado... Ian Morris, welcome to Ancient Greece Declassified. Well, thank you. It's great to, great to be here. Now, one of the paradigms for looking at history that you offer in your recent book is the idea of productive war versus unproductive war. And the argument seems to be that if we look at history, there are wars which, although bloody and vicious, in the long run result in larger, safer societies. But there are also wars that equally bloody and vicious result in less safe societies and areas of the world plagued by more violent death. Now, Persia at the time of the Persian Wars had, uh, under this uh, way of looking at history, had engaged in over a century of productive war and had created probably the largest and perhaps safest society that the world had ever seen. Yeah, that, that could be true. Um, and one of the difficulties of uh, trying to look at history in the very long term like this is that you can see big patterns of play out across thousands of years. And so I think um, more and more historians and anthropologists now agree that you know, if you um, had gone back 10,000 years, if you lived in the Stone Age, uh, your chance of dying violently was quite high. I mean, people estimate it may be as high as 10%. If you live in the 21st century, in spite of all the terrible wars going on, your chance of dying violently is much, much lower. The United Nations thinks it's about 0.7%. So, you know, an um, order of magnitude decline in the danger of dying violently. And there is enough evidence that we can sort of trace at least up to a point how we got from A to B and how the world became so much safer. But having said that, when you start plunging down into the details and saying, you know, well, was the Persian Empire safer, say, than the, the Neo-Babylonian Empire, which had been around 100 years? years before the Persian Empire. At that point, it begins to get a lot harder to make these sort of detailed comparisons. So, um, I mean, my hunch is, yeah, the Persian Empire probably was the safest place to have lived that the world had seen up to that point. Although the, the actual evidence down there on the ground, that's, that's really mushy and messy. Do we know anything about the comparative rates of violent death in the Greek world at the time versus in Persia? Well, it would be hard, um, and again, I'm looking like I'm trying to avoid answering all your questions here, but hard to be too precise about this. There is one source of evidence that would really answer these questions, and that is the remains of people's actual bodies. And uh, you know, a lot of skeletons have been dug up, a lot of them have been studied well. There are very telltale signs uh, that show you often when people have been killed violently. And so at some point, we're going to have enough skeletons that have been studied and published properly that we're going to be begin to be able to say, yes, it looks like Greece in the 5th century BC was more or less dangerous place to live than Persia in the 5th century BC. At the moment, we're not really at that point, in fact, nowhere near it. And so we rely a lot more on much more qualitative kind of evidence. So things like, say, um, the, the, you know, the great historian Thucydides tells us about how if you live in Athens now, people don't carry weapons on the streets anymore. And so it's a pretty safe bet that Athens in his time, around 400 BC, is a safer place to live than it had been one or two hundred years earlier. But at the moment, I think we're not really in a position where we can say 5th you know, century Athens is safer or less safe than 5th century Persia. Well, the rates of violent death in a civic context might have gone dramatically down by Thucydides' time, but Athens was fighting wars all the time and entire armies were vanquished in Egypt and Sicily. So maybe the if you take into account the military deaths 
doesn't seem like the safest place to live at the time. Yeah, well, one of the great paradoxes of history seems to be that this trend toward rates of violent death going down and down has been driven chiefly by creating bigger and stronger governments that organise people and make it more and more difficult for them to run around killing each other every time they fall out over something. But the governments themselves are created through conquest and violence. So you know, one society defeats uh, another in war and absorbs it into a single society, makes it bigger, um, pacifies it internally. And so you've got this weird dynamic going on between wars getting bigger and more violent as they create larger and larger societies, and then the societies being internally more and more peaceful. And so you quite often get this sort of contrast between, say, I mean, our own societies. So we live in very, very peaceful times almost anywhere in the world today compared to what it was like 500 or 1,000 years ago. Very, very peaceful. And yet our ability to kill each other in war is so much higher now than it ever has been in the past. Well, actually, that's not quite true. Um, 30 years ago, we had enough nuclear weapons. We had more than 70,000 warheads in the world. We had enough nuclear weapons to kill everybody in the world in the space of a couple of days. Now we don't. And for every 20 nuclear warheads in the world in the mid-1980s, there's now less than one. So good news. You know, we cannot kill everybody all at once anymore. But we still have more than enough destructive power to kill far more people than would have been possible any time up to the last couple of hundred years. So the whole story, it's sort of a you know, messy story of your ability to kill people goes up and up. And the higher it goes, the less you actually use it to kill people. Some first time readers of your recent book, or some listeners, when they hear about this term productive war, they might think that this is in some way a justification for war. But as far as I understand it from your book, this is in no way a justification. This is an attempt to describe a historical reality that, you know, war is always bloody and full of suffering and terrible, but if you want to understand history, you can see that different wars have different results. Yeah, I, I, when, when I talk about productive war, I, I mean productive in a very specific sense, that um, over the long run, um, in some parts of the world, wars produced bigger societies that had stronger governments that made these safer places to live. And that, that's what the productiveness is all about. Um, but many, many wars didn't do that. Uh, some of them I classify as just being unproductive wars. They have no real impact on the long-term growth of larger, safer societies. Some are downright counterproductive wars in that they, they break down the bigger societies and make smaller and more dangerous societies. Sometimes you get quite long periods uh, when you get sort of one kind of war dominating, like say from about the 5th century AD through to about the 15th in Europe, counterproductive war is very much the dominant form. You get the breakdown of the, the ancient empires and the um, shift into a, a much more fluid and chaotic middle age me medieval period. So you can get long periods when you're just getting sort of one kind of war dominating. So yeah, productive war, very broad brushstroke way of talking about the long-term history of war. And when you zero in on specific wars, it's often very hard to say whether a specific war is productive or not. I like say World War I, great example, obviously, raging 100 years ago. Um, most historians, if you look at World War I on its own, it seems very much not a productive war, just a monstrous waste of life. And yet, on the other hand, if you look at it the way a lot of scholars now do, as part of a longer series of 20th century wars, the outcome of which is the, the post-1945 long long peace, as it's called. In some ways, maybe we should think of World War I as being the beginning of a longer productive war. So yeah, it is kind of very much about the way you look at these things. Well, Persia, now with our 2020 hindsight vision, we can, I think, safely say that they had at least a century of productive war up until the Persian Wars. They had unified the land from the Aegean to the borders of India in a huge and stable empire. Mm -hmm. One of the few glimpses into the actual layout of the empire we get comes from 100 years later from Xenophon. He and 10,000 mercenaries from Greece had to travel across 1,000 miles of Persian territory. And it seems like every time they go up a mountain and come down the other side, there's a different tribe with a different language, different kind of food, different customs, different habitations. So this is not the unified homogenized Roman Empire, right? This is a much more diverse 
association of different communities in a way. Is that true? Yes, yes. I think the Persian Empire is just, it's like a different planet from the ancient Greek world. And um, the Persian Empire, I'd say in most ways, that is more typical of what pre-modern societies were like. Uh, like say, most pre-modern societies, you get a, a ruling elite running the show and the ruling elite kind of plop themselves down on the, the vast bulk of the population, the peasantry. And the peasants don't get out much. You know, peasants basically live in their own villages. Um, if they go more than a couple of days walk from where they were born, that's you know, quite a remarkable thing. And so you'll tend to get very localized languages and customs and cultures and so on. While the ruling elite travel around all over the empire. So if you're a member of the Persian elite, you can go from the Aegean Sea um, to the banks of the river Indus in what's now Pakistan, meeting fairly similar people, talking to each other in the same language, sharing the same kind of jokes, reading the same kind of literature. And you sort of, you float above this great mass of very, very separate peasants. Now, the Greek world is completely different. It, it's ethnically much more homogenous. Uh, the elite is much less set apart from the mass of citizens. And the kind of connections that you get, uh, the similarities between, the, say, the rich guys in Corinth or the rich guys in Athens, these sorts of similarities go much further down the, the, the social spectrum as well. The peasants have much more to do with each other. They speak more or less the same language. Lots and lots of, of cultural similarities. And this, I think, this is one of the reasons why it's so difficult for the Persian Empire to absorb the Greek world. That most places they go, say you're off somewhere in the middle of, of modern Turkey in Anatolia, and you're, it's, I know it's 550 BC, and you're ruled by the Lydians, and you say, okay, Lydian Empire, fine, they, they tax me, I pay my money, they more or less leave me alone. Then you hear this rumour, there's been a great battle, King Croesus of the Lydians has been overthrown, and now King Cyrus of the Persians has taken over. Well, you might say, OK, big deal. What does this actually mean for me? Almost nothing. Some other guy who speaks a foreign language and worships a god I've never heard of is now going to be taking my money as taxes. For most people in the ancient world, it just doesn't matter that much who is calling the shots because they're all the same. They're a bunch of foreigners who are taking all my money. The Greeks feel very, very differently about this. They, they are not easy to slot into one of these big empires with a, a common elite ruling over everybody. And so this, I think this is one of the reasons why the Persians do have difficulty taking over the Greek world. There's a famous story in Herodotus of two Spartan messengers that meet a, a rich Persian subject on the what is now the western coast of Turkey. And this uh, rich Persian tries to get them to realize that life under Persia is better than in Greece. And they kind of say, yeah, but you don't understand. Freedom is what matters, right? And, and then, of course, we have the stories of the American Revolutionary War, or give me liberty or give me death. So many wars have been fought by people who know that if they lose, they'll probably join a safer, larger empire, and yet they want to live in their smaller and perhaps more dangerous situation. Yes, yeah, I think this is a, a perfect illustration of this point that you know, almost everybody values safety, but almost everybody has something they would put above safety. Like say, you know, almost everybody, if, if members of your family are being beaten and raped and dragged off into slavery, you're going to do something about this. You might know perfectly well that, well, if I try to intervene here, there's a very good chance I'll be killed, but I'm going to do it anyway. And um, at least according to the stories, you know, in ancient Sparta, in the American Revolution, and plenty of other places too, plenty of people have said, you know, give me freedom or give me death. I like the, the license plate in New Hampshire, live free or die. Now, of course, we also know that plenty of people didn't say that. And plenty of people were, were you know, looking at King George III over in England and saying, well, you know, he's not so bad. He makes me pay a few taxes, but he's not going to get me into a lot of trouble. So you know, in all these places, you do get people who will make a different choice and will prefer the larger, safer, perhaps more repressive society over the smaller, freer, more dangerous one. Um, but of course, this is one of the things that makes history so complicated. We're all free to make these choices. And there were some states at this time that were rooting for the Persians and were hoping to be the big guys in the block once the Persians take over. The Thessalians, for example, sent messages to the king inviting him over. And Sparta, in particular, was offered the leadership of Greece by the Persians. And the myth of Sparta has been so prevalent in history that we think, oh, that, that could never have worked. The Spartans are just the most courageous, valiant people of all time. They would never settle for anything other than true liberty. 
But in reality, I mean, they were humans. So the real question is, why didn't the Spartans take the offer that the Persians were making? After all, uh, less than a century later, they did ask the Persians for help against the Athenians in the Peloponnesian War. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's an interesting question because we don't really know an answer because we, we have so little written from Sparta itself. We know so little about what was going on in these guys' heads uh, in the early 5th century BC. Because as you say, the incentives to, to turn your coat and go over to the Persian side, for some people, these were quite strong. I mean, almost every point in the storyline that we get in Herodotus of, of the war against the Persians, almost every city that comes up, we hear about some group within that city saying, ooh, maybe we would be better with the Persians, or at least wanting to sort of hedge their bets and sit on the fence. And I mean, you can see why, you know, if you're an aristocrat in a city that has sort of democratic leanings, you might well feel that I could perhaps be a tyrant. I could be the sole ruler of this city if we're in the Persian Empire. If I betray my city to the Persians, I will be much better off. And you might even think your whole city will be much better off as a result as well. So, yeah, there are all kinds of pressures on you. And um, why the Spartans decided not to Medize, not to sign up with the Persians, um, I don't think we really know the answer to that. So the Persians amass a huge army consisting of troops gathered from the entire empire, and Herodotus explains how the number of soldiers was determined. They, they made this big enclosure that could fit like 10,000 people, and they filled it up with people and then had them leave from a different exit, and then filled it up again, and then they counted the number of times they filled this up. So this is a quite remarkable way of counting people, and it sounds like a really good method, but then the number he comes up with is like 5 million. So um, I think most historians today don't by that figure, but what is your take on that? It's possible the Persians did do something like this. Uh, they, they almost certainly needed to have a ballpark figure for what size their army was, just for logistical reasons, so they can think about how much supplies they need to have. But this is also one of the reasons why so few historians believe the numbers in Herodotus. Um, there is just no way they could have fed the millions of people he said they brought into Greece. If they had had that many, they would have died of hunger very, very quickly, and died of thirst as well. I mean, he talks about them drinking rivers dry, which is quite possible um, in the summer in Greece. So um, I think probably the best way to look at Herodotus' numbers is that he's saying that this was a really, really big army. And that's about as precise as you can be with his numbers. And he's probably also saying even for the Persian Empire, this was really, really big. And so beyond that, we're reduced to guesswork. And um, I mean, my feeling is that if we guess that the, per the whole Persian forces say somewhere between a quarter of a million and half a million troops, that would fit the bill for really, really big, even by the standards of the Persian Empire. And maybe it was the biggest army that was ever assembled in the ancient world. Is that including the navy or? or yes, yeah, so I think kind of for the, the whole shebang. If you've got, say, if you've got half a million people involved for the fleet and for the army and for all the camp followers, that is a mind boggling number for the ancient world. So whatever the exact number is, it's huge. Yes. And uh, it's a bigger force than the Greeks had ever seen before. Yes. And yet they were able to resist it. So the question is, what do we know about the population density of Greece? and? Um, I know that both you and your colleague Josh Ober have studied demographics and have are kind of changing the historical picture that, after all, the population density might have been greater than we have thought before. Yes, well, well, Stanford has become quite a sort of ancient demography place. Our Roman history colleagues, Walter Scheidel and Richard Saller, have also done enormous amounts of work on this. But the, the picture that's now starting to emerge is actually quite like what a lot of historians thought 100 years ago, that when the Persians show up in Greece, uh, you know, 490, 480 BC, this is an extraordinary moment in Greek history. Um, the population densities are higher than they're going to be again until about AD 1900, I mean, remarkable period. Wow. And there's a, a number of factors, I mean, the, the sort of densities we're talking about, like say in Athens, um, in the, the countryside around Athens, 
you might well have had about 200 people per square kilometer, which for the ancient world, is uh, this is an astonishingly high density to have. And so the reasons for this, why is this happening? Well, part of it is part of a much bigger picture, um, driven very largely by climate. The first millennium BC sees a general improvement of the climate in the sort of latitudes the Greek world is in. And all the way from Spain to China, we see significant population growth across this whole area. So in partly, you know, Greece is just part of a bigger story. But the other part is um, Greece takes these bigger trends to an extreme, probably because Greece has been so underpopulated around about 1000 BC, that there'd been a big collapse uh, after 1200 BC when all the palaces in Greece are destroyed. Population falls by at least half, maybe three quarters. And for a while, Greece is relatively very underpopulated. And then you get this huge swing back after about 750 BC as the, as the, the climate starts to improve um, and um, numbers are growing really quickly in Greece. So a, a lot of it's driven by these forces beyond human control. But then another thing that clearly happens in the Greek world is uh, your population is starting to rise, happening over a lot of places. People are starting to say, you know, how, how do I feed my babies? Food is running short, times are getting hard. Everybody is trying to figure out ways to get in more food. And the Greeks come up with some particularly sensible um, ways to do this. They, they take advantage of their geographical position. You're stuck uh, in this land with all these peninsulas and bays and harbours, sticking out into the Mediterranean Sea. And they kind of become the, the middlemen for Mediterranean trade. They're, they're kind of sucking in food from other places. The, what's now Ukraine is the most famous source of wheat they bring in, but also Egypt, Sicily, lots of places. They suck food into the Greek world, they export finished manufactured goods, um, and they're able to support population densities, like I say, phenomenally high for the ancient world, which makes it a little bit bad luck for the Persians that they happen to show up at just that point and try to conquer the Greek world. So the Persians come at the moment when Greece is experiencing an economic and demographic boom, and Athens had recently become a democracy. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned in your book um, the argument of Immanuel Kant, much later, arguing for a perpetual peace through a League of Nations, and these would be nations that are republics. And his idea was that uh, if the citizenry has a say in whether they go to war or not, it's reasonable to assume that they're not going to want to go to war. Uh, but you also point out in your book that it quickly became clear that there's a problem with the argument if you look at the history because actually democracies and republics do tend to go to war a lot. And uh, Athens, within the first few years of its being a democracy, sent this expedition to, to Persia to help the Ionian cities on the western coast of Turkey that were under Persia. They, they sent a few ships to attack the big guy across the way. So, um, well, first of all, if we look at the ancient oligarchies and democracies in the Greek world, are the democracies ready to go to war more than the oligarchies in, in certain situations? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, Kant's ideas about perpetual peace coming about through the creation of republics, I mean, seems to me that you know, in some ways he's right in what he's saying, and in some ways he was sort of disastrously wrong. And I think that the way that he was right seems to be that um, as he points out, you know, if you are voting on whether to go to war and you are one of the guys who's actually going to go out there and get stabbed or shot or whatever it might be, the the threshold for going to war is likely to be higher than it is if you're some remote king who just sends all these subjects he's never seen to go out and die. Um, but I think the bit that Kant didn't foresee, because of course when he's writing in 1790s, I think it was, when he's writing, there aren't really a lot of republics to look at. Um, what he didn't see is that the way governments can meet that threshold of persuading people to vote in favour of a war that puts themselves in harm's way is by persuading them that this war is really, really important. Um, by, by creating what historians like to call people's wars, the, the uh, a sense that our very survival, the, the future of everything we hold dear, depends on fighting this war. And if we lose this war, there's no way to count the cost. We just cannot lose this war. And what this has tended to produce is wars of a level of ferocity that you often don't get with the wars directed by the distant kings. Because they, they have an objective, they want to get their objective, they don't want to pay more than they have to for this war. Whereas the democratic wars tend to be vicious and total. Like, um, 
the, say something like World War II, I think would have been very hard to explain to someone in most periods of ancient history. It just would have made no sense. Unconditional surrender. Why do you want that? So um, I think... Uh, the, the savagery of some of the wars that we start to see in the, the 5th and 4th centuries BC in the Greek world, a lot of it is driven by the sort of the dark side of the Kantian story of perpetual peace, the per perpetual violence side of that story. And, and But as for whether the democracies go to war more or less than the oligarchies, I think, I think it's very hard to tell. I think what Kant would have said is that he would expect democracies to go to war against each other less than they go to war against oligarchies because with, with you know, two sides voting on this reason and rationality are more likely to prevail. And this, of course, has become a, a great idea in political theory, that there is this, this concept, the democratic peace, that countries with democracies don't go to war against each other. And some people refine it even further into the, the golden arches theory of peace, that countries that have McDonald's don't go to war with each other. There's almost no example of two countries that have McDonald's restaurants fighting each other, which is a very powerful insight. Um, but in the ancient world, uh, with the democratic peace theory, one of the most interesting things about this is, of course, this war between Athens and Syracuse, both of which appear to be democracies, and yet they seem to be completely undeterred by that from going to war against each other. So I think this is one of the cases where the ancient Greek world actually has a lot to say to um, current thinking within political theory. To go back to Herodotus, though, he gives us this story of the, the would-be tyrant of the city of Miletus on the coast of what is now Turkey under the Persian Empire, and he he's trying to get support for this revolt that the Athenians end up helping them with. But he goes first to Sparta, and he tries to convince the Spartan king to help, and the king says no. And then he goes to Athens, and he goes to the assembly and speaks to the, to the demos, to the people, and they vote yes. And then Herodotus says that in this way he demonstrated that it is easier to deceive a multitude than an individual. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, another great Herodotus story. He is the master of the storytelling. Um, and of course, yeah, a very, very topical story. I mean, democracies, we seem to be going through a little patch at the moment of democracies making some very peculiar decisions, um, which experts like to think that they wouldn't be making. And again, you know, another of the, the long-term, well-established debates within political theory is, you know, is democracy uh, democracy uh, posited on the idea of gathering together a large number of people who you know, by definition have average amounts of intelligence and normally are not going to have very much information at their disposal is that really the best way of making political decisions i mean is it really true that uh, a random cross sample of the people knocking about in athens say one in ten of whom could probably even write his own name most of whom had you know, never been outside of attica in their whole life Lives. Is that really a better way of making decisions than just having you know, a couple of kings get together and talk about it over a cup of wine? Um, and I think on the whole, the record of the Athenian democracy suggests, yes, it is, um, that on the whole, their decisions tend to be better than the decisions of most of the other Greek city-states, except when they're not. And when they're not, they tend to be disastrously and horribly wrong, like we see at the end of the Peloponnesian War. So, yeah, I think another of the, the great unanswered questions. A further interesting point about the, the would-be tyrant of Miletus is that uh, we now know from recent archaeological discoveries in the Hittite archives, the Hittite Empire took up a lot of the same space that the Persian Empire later would take, but a thousand years earlier. And in the Hittite records, we see that the Mycenaeans, the Greeks of a thousand years earlier, and the Hittites were fighting over Miletus. And there's like a few characters that appear that are particular troublemakers and they're all based <laughs> in Miletus. So, I mean, is this like a geopolitical hotspot by its geography? I mean, if we continue further, we have the Crusades, we have mm -hmm. the Byzantines versus the Turks, and even now we have uh, recent uh, tensions between the Greek and Turkish states. So. Is this just like a geographically doomed area? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, geography is one of the big driving forces in history. But um, the, the way I think it, it, it tends to work is that on the one hand, geography drives the development of societies and certain things are only possible in certain places. Like say, um, you know, it's no mystery 
that the industrial revolution happened first in England, which is basically a big lump of coal with a little bit of dirt sprinkled on top. That is an obvious place for the industrial revolution to happen. Highly unlikely the industrial revolution could have happened in the middle of the Sahara Desert. So geography drives a large part of the story of the development of societies. But at the same time, the development of societies drives a large part of what geography means. And so you know, England being a lump of coal with some dirt on top, that just didn't matter through most of history because there was nothing you could really do with the coal. In fact, it was kind of a bad thing because it meant the soil was not all that great. Um, so only when you get to the point when you have these steam engines that can be powered by coal, suddenly does the coal get to be important. And I think a place like Miletus is rather a similar sort of thing. Uh, at certain points in history, um, the area around Miletus, the western coast of modern Turkey, this is, as you say, a geographical hotspot. You've got the great empires of Western Asia, uh, and then to the west of them, you've got the Mediterranean Sea with the potential of all kinds of wealth that can be sucked out of there. And one of the great fault lines, run, sort of geopolitical fault lines, runs down the west coast of Turkey. And I think we see this in the ancient context very much um, with uh, in 546 BC the Persian Empire conquers um, everything on the mainland of what's now Turkey comes up to the Aegean Sea and then they stop they, they go off after that point they conquer Babylon they conquer Egypt they conquer out in the east lots of other stuff seems much more important than proceeding further to the west it's only about 25 years later that they come back to what's to them the northwest frontier their, their frontier butting onto the Greek world and they start to say we need to do something about about this. And at that point, Miletus starts to become this incredibly important place. When Miletus rebels against the Persian Empire, this is a really, really big deal. And in you know, quite a few ways, down to 494 BC, the point the Persians destroy Miletus, um, I would say if you had to put your money on which city in the Aegean world is going to be the great player in the 5th century, I think there's a lot of arguments to put your money on Miletus. But once the Persians have killed everybody there, you know, that's an example of social development trumping geography. When they're all dead, you know, it's, the geography stops being very important. Miletus falls back into the second, third rank of powers. So, yeah, there are certain places that are sort of determined by geography to be vitally important in the centre of the story until the point that the story makes the geography change its meaning when they just sort of then drop out of the story. One of the traditional explanations for why the Greeks won this war which goes back all the way to Herodotus, is that they had better weapons, they had better military technology. Now, the question then is, why did they have better technology? And in your book, you talk about the issue of modern Europe. Why did modern European states develop technology at such a faster rate compared to the rest of the world? And one of the theories that you mention that others have suggested is that because the Europeans were fighting with each other all the time, this constant fighting with each other and competition drove technological innovation, including military technology. And Herodotus kind of says a similar thing about Greece. He says that Athens and the island of Aegina near Athens had a naval war before this invasion. And that's really the reason why Athens had a navy when the Persians arrived. It just so happened that uh, in the past 10 years, they had engaged in this naval struggle. They had built up this beautiful new cutting edge navy. Then the Persians get there and they have this navy ready. And Herodotus says that it's the war with Aegina, of Athens and Aegina, that was the savior of Greece. So is yes. he kind of putting forth a similar theory? And do you think that explains enough of the technological disparity? Yes. Yes. Well, I think I think I would say this sort of two different questions sort of rolled into one here. I mean, the first one I'd say was. Um, is it true that the Greeks really did have better military technology than the Persians? Then the second one, I think, would be this question of, um, is it war that's driving the, the Greek sort of technological precocity? And with the first one, I mean, it's always very difficult to say, uh, well, not always, usually very difficult to say who's got better military technology. I mean, military people like to say that technology is one of these rock, paper, scissors kinds of things. That something that is fantastic technology in one context is disastrous technology in another context. And like say, oh, we've seen you know, recent examples of this, that no army in the world can go head to head with the United States military and expect to 
survive the first couple of weeks of fighting. It's simply not going to happen. Um, and yet the same technology and organization that made the US Army able to annihilate Saddam Hussein's armies in a space of a few days, that was turned out not to be very good organizational technology when it came to trying to suppress an insurgency. And so this sort of problem goes all the way back with military history. And um, in a way, I think you can say that one of the reasons the Persians got defeated when they invaded the Greek world is that they were so pig-headed and uh, that they played to the strengths of the Greeks. And um, you talk about the armor. Well, they, they, like, they agreed to fight the Greeks in places where that armor or their, their hoplite phalanxes, heavy infantry, where that armor was a huge advantage for the Greeks. That was a big mistake. Uh, and so, I mean, you could argue over whether the Greeks really do have better military technology or not. But certainly, you're absolutely right to say they have rapidly changing military technology. They have a lot of innovation going on. And this, which raises your, your second question, is this being driven by the incessant warfare and the fact that the Greek world is broken up into all these little city-states constantly duking it out? And again, um, a sort of a yes and no kind of answer, I think, is called for here. That people will often say that technological innovation generally is driven by war and by the investments governments make in technology so that they win wars. And they'll say things like, well, look at... Um, aircraft in World War I, or the radio, radar in World War II, nuclear power, all these things are driven by governments spending vast amounts of money during war to get the better technology. And they have all these sorts of spin-offs after the war is over that power the, the US economy after 1945. And I think in a lot of ways that is clearly true, that war can be a great driver of technological growth. But on the other hand, what economists will often say is, yes, but wait a minute, there's a certain amount of investment and research energy out there to be poured into technological innovation. And what war tends to do is to drag the investment off in specific directions. And so lots and lots of money gets poured into um, radar and radio uh, technology during World War II. You've got to ask yourself, what would have been done with that money if World War II hadn't been going on? Would people have just spent it all on champagne and bubble bath? Or would they have invested it in something else? And maybe the other things they might have invested it in would actually have been better generally for technological progress in that society. And I think with the Greek world, we got the same question. Um, and I think... Uh, yeah, it's a very strong case that um, Greek maritime, military maritime technology is fueled by this war between Athens and Aegina, and Athens building this fleet of about 200 triremes, without which almost certainly they couldn't have beaten the Persians. But what would have happened if that war hadn't taken place? I mean, they had all these resources. We don't know what they would have done with the resources. Maybe they would have found ways to use them that would have had even more important um, benefits for the Greek world. So um, all these questions, I think the, the really interesting questions always seem to be the ones that are hardest to answer. Another paradigm that you offer in your book uh, for analyzing history is the idea of the culminating point of productive war. So you can have a Roman Empire or a Persian Empire that is engaging in productive warfare as it's expanding and every stage results in a larger, safer society. But at some point, these empires tend to uh, exceed what you call the culminating point of productive warfare. And usually this is a disastrous campaign that's a wake-up call, like the Romans uh, under Augustus, invading Germania and uh, losing two legions, and they're like, okay, it's time to give up on the idea of conquering Germany. Or the Persians, um, well, what would you say was the culminating point for Persia? Yes, well, I, I borrow this idea of a culminating point from um, Karl von Clausewitz, who like the, the, uh, lived about 200 years ago, was the first really serious kind of scientific analyst of warfare. And he was the guy who noticed that you look at the history of great successful empires, and I mean, he lived um, during the time when Napoleon was busy conquering Europe, so he based a lot of this on personal observation as well. So you look at these great empires, and they win all these wars, they absorb all these societies, they take them over, they get bigger and bigger and richer and richer, until they don't. And all of them at a certain point, they, they carry on doing what they have been doing. Like Napoleon been fighting his wars in Eastern Europe, beating everybody up. In 1812, Napoleon decides to invade Russia. And Clausewitz was a German and was um, was 
enraged that the king of Prussia would no longer fight against Napoleon. So he volunteers to fight on the Russian side during the 1812 war, where he sees Napoleon, of course, going down to this crushing defeat that ends um, the, the whole Napoleonic empire, basically. And this is what makes him realise we've seen this same story over and over again in the past. Um, you keep on doing what's worked so well for you in the past, and then you suddenly discover it no longer works, and it brings on disaster, in fact. And I think he was absolutely right in this. We see this over and over again in the ancient empires. And I think that what we also see is... Um, most of the ancient empires had went through multiple culminating points. And I think the reason for this, very obvious really, it's, you know, it's hard to know how much is enough until you've gone a little bit too far. And I think this probably applies to all of our lives as well as just to the great empires. But so the, the Persians discover enough um, after 480 BC. They get beaten up badly in the Greek world. Uh, they, you know, it's, it's a little bit fuzzy, but maybe um, 20 years later they have one more go at conquering the Greek world that gets nipped in the bud. And then they say, enough, we're not going to try that anymore. We're going to figure out diplomatic means for dealing with these Greeks. And the diplomatic means actually turn out to be really successful. They do really, really well until Alexander the Great comes along and, and decides to conquer them all. So they have this sort of culminating experience there. They have culminating experiences out at the eastern end of their empire as well. They have culminating experiences out on the steppes. They go through multiple ones of these. And it does seem like this is the only way we find out where the limits are, is by, by going a little bit beyond them and saying, uh-oh, better not do that again. So when Xerxes comes to power after Darius dies, Darius dies before he can do his punishing expedition to the Greeks. So Xerxes comes to power and he says, I'm going to attack the Greeks and I'm not doing anything new. I'm following the custom of Cyrus and of Cambyses and of Darius, which is what we can say productive war. And as you say, it's worked so far, so I'm going to keep doing it because that's the way to go. And there's a counselor there, um, Artabazus, who says, don't do it, it's foolish, it's a recipe for disaster. It's like he is kind of like a, we could say, a proto-Ian Morris, who <laughs> sees, who foresees that this is the culminating point and it will be a very bitter wake-up call. So is there any way for expanding powers using the knowledge of history to actually step on the brakes before they have this terrible wake of call. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I've been compared to worse people in Artabanus before. That's quite a, a generous <laughs> comparison. <laughs> yeah, I think it, it can be very difficult. Um, I, uh, sometimes, clearly, the answer is yes, that there are contexts where you have to be really boneheaded not to see that this is a th this war is a really bad idea. This is going beyond the culminating point. And um, on the whole, of course, th those wars don't happen when it's really obvious what to do. Um, you know, if it's really obvious it's going to be a mistake, the mistake doesn't happen. The problem is always the ones where it's not obvious. And you know, very few people have gone to war on the assumption they're going to lose. Most people think they have some realistic chance of winning their wars, even if after the event, uh, it's clear they were completely mistaken about this. No, but it's it just, it's very difficult to plan for the things that you don't expect and for the things where everything is unclear. And those are the ones where things explode and get out of hand. When I say 100 years ago, 1914, um, a lot of European powers had thought long and hard about what they might do to prevent a colonial conflict from blowing up and turning into the First World War. They thought very little about what they would do uh, to prevent some uh, terrorist murder in Serbia from turning into the First World War. World War. And that's what blindsided them. That's what caught them. And um, uh, Robert Gates, the former Defense Secretary, used to like to say that the US military has a 100% record in predicting where the next war will happen. We have never once been right. Uh, and his point, of course, was that when we know what's going to happen, we take steps to make sure it doesn't happen. It's the things you can't see that always get you. And again, a point that Thucydides saw all too clearly. He said, you, know, you um, once the war starts, you really have no idea idea what's going to happen. Well, that's a lot of food for thought. <laughs> Ian Morris, thank you very much for coming on the show. Well, thanks very much for having me on. This has been great. Next time, we'll shift gears away from bloody conflicts to a very different kind of warfare, the battleground of ideas. Skipping ahead 100 years, Athens is the intellectual hub of the Mediterranean, and we're going to see what were some of the revolutionary new ways of thinking that were emerging, and why were they perceived by some as dangerous. We have a very special guest coming on the show. I'll leave that as a surprise. 
In the meantime, leave your comments or questions on the website at greasepodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram with the handle at Grease Podcast to stay up to date on upcoming episodes and other news. And please leave us a review on iTunes to help get the word out about the podcast. Thanks for listening to Ancient Greece Declassified. Can you still sing Orpheus? Then sing something that's going to last. A thousand years slips by so fast, goes off into a dusty myth with you.